From the Oakland Hills to Jack London Square, the Port of Oakland to the Coliseum, KTVU presents Talk of the Town, an engaging conversation about the people and issues important to Oakland. Hello, I'm Dave Clark. And welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm really glad you're here with me. And I have a wonderful guest, a lady I've been waiting to meet. She's not only a talented businesswoman and entrepreneur, but she is doing great things that will affect people not only here in the Bay Area, but around the country. Her name is Fawn Weaver. She's the CEO, the founder of a wonderful company called Uncle Nearest. And here's one of their products. Fawn, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Now, I am so, I, I wanted to meet you because you're a role model. Thank you. You're a talented businesswoman, and you're doing great things with this product, which has really taken off. Uncle Nearest, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Talk about this product yeah. and what it is that <laughs> you're proud of. Yeah. We actually, we just announced that for the fourth year in a row, we're the most awarded bourbon in the world. And Say that, that again, <laughs> for For the fourth year in a row, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022, we, Uncle Nearest is the most awarded bourbon in the world. And that it is Nearest Green, the first known African-American yes. master distiller, that it's his great-great-granddaughter who is the master blender and she is the one that we give all credit to yeah. for all the awards that we are winning. I think it, it all comes full circle and it's, it's pretty ex ex extraordinary. And it's a black owned company. It is, well, you're looking at it. Yes, me. I know. <laughs> with your husband, mm -hmm. with your husband. Yes, technically no. Oh, okay, uh, all right. But only because he and I divide and conquer. Understood. And legal laws do some really weird things. Yeah. So we can't own restaurants and do other things if we both have ownership in distillery. So we divide and conquer. He has the restaurants, bars, and that kind of thing, and, and I have the distillery. But yeah, there's no daylight between us. So you're a serial entrepreneur, mm -hmm. business. Your hands, business-wise, yeah. goes in a lot of different ways. It does, it does, and it has for 28 years now. Really? Yeah. Well, tell me some of the things, the business interests you have. Yeah, well, my very first company was a PR special events firm, and yeah. I still, our company does easily over 3,000 events a year, and I am l literally out myself in Victoria E.D. Butler, our master blender. We probably do press five times a week uh, and, uh, around the country and, and really around the world, any place. We're in about 13 countries outside of the U.S., so also around the world and and that's carried with me through my entire career i'm also a new york times best-selling author usa today best-selling author i'm writing the book on nearest green as we speak and and that'll come out some point next year and but just i've invested in restaurants and bars i've been hotel general manager learning the hospitality business so now we're able to own hotels and and i have a background in it as well so this is just, it's been a life of, of work and I love it. I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to do something that I enjoy so much. You're incredibly impressive. Thank you. Uh, it's good to, the name, Uncle Nearest, yes. that's associated with these products yes, and many yes, others, yes. it's a lot of history. It's a lot of Explain history. Explain Uncle Nearest. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. His legal name was Nathan and people, a lot of times, if they don't know better, they will call him by his legal name, thinking that's the more respectful version, because we're used to an Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben, yeah. and the history behind aunt and uncle, especially in the South, during the years of enslavement. But in Lynchburg, Tennessee, where Nearest Green taught a young Jack Daniel, the three most respected men in that. So we're talking about the Jack. The Jack. The, the five he foot two Jack. Jack uh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And, but in that town of Lynchburg, Tennessee, the most respected men were Uncle Jack, Uncle Felix, and Uncle Nearest. It was a sign of endearment, of respect. And of those three men I just mentioned, uh, two were white. And, and so for us, it was a matter if we had put Nearest Green on the bottle, yeah. Number one, it sounds like your nearest golf course, right? Right. And so people, what is what is nearest right. green? And so we had to make sure that people knew that he was a person. So Nathan Green would have made more sense. But for the fact that nearest never referred to himself as Nathan, 
neither did his children or his grandchildren you and their legal documents. And so for enslaved people following slavery, following the abolishment, a lot of them chose what they wanted to be called because their given names were associated with either their slave owners yeah. or a child of the slave owner. And in our area, in Lynchburg, Tennessee, our distillery is in Shelbyville, which is just 20 minutes going toward Nashville from Lynchburg, Tennessee. And our area, the greatest slave trader in Tennessee, literally came in and out on his horse, Nathan Bedford Forrest. And he slave traded more than a thousand slaves a year in our, in our Tennessee, in our middle Tennessee area. And Nathan came through our area to recruit Confederate soldiers for his force escorts. So I'm not surprised in the least bit that Nearest Green wow. would have chosen to not be called Nathan. And so the name that made most sense for this brand was the name that people in town called him yeah. as a term of endearment and respect, and that was Uncle Nearest. Yeah. Explain to me how someone who, a former slave, mm -hmm. learned to become a master distiller yes. and teaching Jack Daniels. Yeah. How did that happen? There was a, I, I believe the reason why we always say he's the world's first known African-American master distiller is I believe there were many that came before him. If you look at all of the bourbons, especially coming out of Kentucky or the rye whiskeys coming out of Pennsylvania, Maryland, mm -hmm. that area, the chance that the white men wearing collared shirts were the ones doing the whiskey making, yeah. real slim, Yeah, real right. slim. And, and so they all had black distillers. This is, and, and most of them were enslaved distillers. And so where he learned it, we know that he originally came from Maryland, and that is where whiskey began. People think that bourbon is the native uh, whiskey for our country. It was actually rye, because that's mm. the grain that grew the most in that East Coast area. And it wasn't until they began migrating to Kentucky for a tax break and in Kentucky, it's corn that grows. Hmm. That's how we ended up with bourbon versus rye whiskey being the majority of what we're drinking in this country. But he, he began in Maryland. We don't know if he perfected his craft in Maryland and then was traded into Tennessee, or if he learned in hmm. Tennessee, or if he learned along the way. Unfortunately, records of enslaved people is like trying to track branded yeah. cattle. Mm -hmm. It just didn't exist. We yeah. were property literally deeded on the same line as, as cattle and chickens sure. and things of yeah. that nature. You'd have, you know, four Negroes in the deed books. Mm -hmm. And so tracking property that is moving That's is amazing. very, very difficult. Wow. How would you describe his personality? Yeah. How he how he might have looked? I'm trying to put some meat yeah. and bones on yeah. Uncle Nearest. Well, the, the beautiful thing is, and we're so fortunate for this, is Nearest's children, uh, three of his boys, continued to work for Jack after Nearest retired. Okay. And we have images of them. Really? We have images of all of his grandchildren. And it's so cool, when you come into our distillery, we have a 323 acre distillery in Shelbyville, and you walk in, and I commissioned all paintings of his children and grandchildren by a, a painter named Raymond Bonilla, and it literally lines an entire corridor and what you will notice about his descendants is number one, they always looked dead into the camera. Really? There was no looking down or around. Yeah. The level of confidence, you could see it. Their shoulders were back, their chest was out, and they are dressed to the nines, to the nines. Really? He passed a legacy that his, his children and his grandchildren, they were all so incredibly respected in the community, in Lynchburg, and they were at the top of the Masons, which that group at that yeah. time would have been, you know, I guess what we, we call the, Ill, what do they call it, the Illuminati? <laughs> I was about <laughs> that, to say yes, basic, yeah. That's basically the Masons, yes. right? And uh, one of his grandsons, Jesse Green, there's a photo that I have of him, and he has this pin, this insignia, and there's an insignia here and an insignia there, and I asked someone from the Mason, I said, I know you can't tell me a whole lot, but can you at least tell me what these pins mean? And he said, uh, Jesse was a Shriner. I said, well, what is that? And he said, that's at the top of the Masons. Now, I knew that there's black Masons and white Masons, yeah, right, right? right. And so I said, so is it at the top of the black Masons, or how does that work? He said, a Shriner's at the top of both. Oh. So this is his grandson, and the level wow. of power, and the, the person who holds the Mason books 
for Lynchburg as one of of Jack's of Neeris's descendants still alive, and uh, he wow. did at least confirm for me one thing, which was Neeris's boys and his grandsons were all Masons, and that wow. was a that was a, a a place of power, it, for sure. And yes. everything that we've learned, and we know that that Neeris was a fiddler. Okay. Hey. We know he was a fiddler, that that is something when he wasn't working, he very much so enjoyed fiddling. His grandson, Jesse, continued that legacy yeah. and he was a fiddler as well. And we know that we can kind of piece together based on Jack's descendants and Nearest's descendants one generation down. We can piece together a lot of Jack and Nearest's relationship because it continued through his nephew, Lim, who he turned the distillery over to, mm. and Nearest's. Uh, son, George Green. Lim Motlow ran that town. He ran everything. Wow. But when Lim was upset or if he had had a little bit too yeah. much to drink, yeah. the only person who could talk him down was George Green. Wow. So George Green's granddaughter, Helen Butler, she said that she remembers he, he raised her till she was 13 it, when he passed away. And she remembered so vividly every time Lim would drink a little too much, mm -hmm. George would get a phone call. And he'd go down to Lim's house and say, now Lim, you know you can't talk to people like that, Lim. But the, the amount That's of great. respect yes. that Jack's nephew had for Neeris's son, that no one else, wow. could, no one yeah. else could garner Lim's respect, that came from the generation before. So we're able to gather that, uh, one of the things just based on the personality of his mm -hmm. children that I've been able to, to gather is, it's people always say, you know, I'm sure he's looking down, proud of you. And I said, based on what I know, Nearest is looking down and going, what is all the hub hub about? <laughs> Here's my stuff. And with yeah. whiskey, yeah. you know. And, and so I, I tell people all the time, the things that have happened with this company, it's that when we, when we launched Uncle Nearest, it was the first time in history that a bottle in the spirits business had been named after an African-American. Mm -hmm. That's astounding. Yes. We literally have been a part of this business for 400, more than 400 years. Very first time. When we opened our distillery in Shelbyville, first time a distillery has ever had the name of an African-American. Wow. And again, and, and this year, we opened in 2019. This year, we will be one of the top 10 most visited distilleries in the world and within the next two to three years we will be in that top three and so people are Bravo. literally pilgrimaging to our distillery from all over the world wow. and just to experience this this wonder and and this this we i always i just i love to say that the distillery grounds was were built on the impossible yeah it's never been done before there's never been a wow. spirit brand that was successful that was founded by an african-american ever not black, not white, not black, or not female, not male. No African American has ever successfully founded a a spirit brand. That's amazing. Bravo to you. Thank you. And and all of the people who were on your team. I wanted to ask you two things. One, yeah. was it history that drew you to this? and mm -hmm. Uncle Nearest, mm -hmm. or was it just a, a good business decision? Yeah, well, uh, well, it definitely wasn't a good business decision because 99.9% .9 of these things fail. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so it was a very risky business decision. It was the history, and it was the idea that in my lifetime, I could cement the legacy of someone that uh, is of my race. Yeah. And that otherwise, prob people probably would have for continued it would yeah. have just gotten lost to history over time. Hmm. And so for me, at, at the time that I founded this in 2016, we're in the mm -hmm. middle of a, a, a pretty difficult election mm -hmm. and race relations in our country yes. were uh, not great, to say the least. The worst that I had seen in, in our 40 years. And when this story came out, it came out through the New York Times. And the story was essentially that the white preacher and distiller that had been credited with teaching Jack Daniel that the people of Lynchburg said it wasn't him, but it was an enslaved man on his property by the name of Uncle Nearest. Yeah. And, and so they were, the New York Times was sharing <laughs> that, and Jack Daniels was confirming that. The thing that was interesting to me is in that, in 40 years of living at that time, yeah. 
there's not a ubiquitous brand, American brand, that I could ever say unequivocally that there was an African American at the beginning. Now we know that there were plenty, but we weren't allowed to patent, we were not allowed to trademark, and so there are a lot of our inventions and our products that are still out there to this day, but we can't actually prove that we were there. Right. When you, uh, If you ever gone down to Houston, there's a restaurant called Lucille's, and Lucille's mm. was started by this woman's uh, grandchildren, I think it is, and, okay. and they share the history, but she was the person who invented the instant biscuit. Pillsbury came to her and tried to buy the recipe. She said no. They came back to her multiple times trying to buy the recipe, and she said no. no. And her her descendants believe that they reverse engineered it. And so that pop, and then we put all of our biscuits in, they believe that that's actually Lucille's. But really? they can't prove it. Hmm. And so our ability to be able to actually prove this legacy, it was the first time we were seeing it. But also what drew me to this particular story was this relationship between Nearest and Jack Daniel. You had an African-American man who became a mentor, a teacher, a friend, to a young orphan boy who never grew over a five foot two, and Jack who, Daniel, Jack Daniel at, who lost his mother f at four months old. He was actually wet nurse, the, the man I mentioned earlier, Uncle Felix. Yeah. Uncle Felix's wife was Jack's wet nurse. He, he was wet nurse as a kid. His mother, his father very quickly married another woman, which in those days, they okay. didn't know how to raise children, yeah, right. right? And his mother died from typhus fever after seven days. So she's raising 10 kids, including a four month old. Wow. Seven days later, she's gone. There's no warning, there's no. So the father, Jack's father, went and married someone pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. That person wasn't a fan of Jack. Oh. So at seven years old, about seven years old, Jack goes to a nearby farm by the name of uh, Dan Call, the preacher and distiller, which we, we now own that, that farm. Okay. And he goes to Dan Call and works as a chore boy. This is not a mm. luxurious life. This is, he's sleeping in the barn because there's mm -hmm. 10 kids in the house, right? He's going out and getting water from the well. Because I own the property, I know how far the distance is yeah. to that spring box and to the well. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't short. So he's going out to the well, he's getting water, he's bringing it back, he's feeding slop to the pigs, he's milking cows. Like this is not a glamorous yeah. life. And then you have Nears Green on this same 313 acre property. Dan Call was a preacher who married a teetotaler. So his house was here, his church was here about a 20 minute walk on the property. Yeah. His distillery was here about a 20 minute walk. So his worlds were all kept separate yes. until the church, the temperance movement was coming in. His teetotaling wife was not happy about this distillery. And so he had to make a decision. Well, his decision was he was going to continue being a preacher of this church that was on his grounds, okay. but he wasn't gonna shut down the distillery. <laughs> Interesting. But the, the benefit or the beauty of it was he didn't have to because Nearest Green was the one making the whiskey. Wow. And so Nearest had his own world out there and you had this very young, curious boy, uh, Jack, who was always asking about what's going on mm -hmm. over there, smoke coming up through the holler. Yeah. You got the mules and the wagons coming in and out, like what's happening yeah, over right. there? And uh, Jack Daniel's legacy, the only authorized biography of Jack Daniel, it said that in uh, when 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 Jack was eight years old, so that puts it at 1856, which is why the first label, the first bottle we ever 1856. released, 1856, and that that he then introduced Jack to Nearest by saying, "This is Uncle Nearest. He's the best whiskey maker I know of." Well, that's significant because there were 16 distilleries in a four-mile radius. Wow. And he's saying he's Nearest the best. is the best. Well, the part that people don't know, and I only know it because I did all of the research and brought in so yeah. many historians, archivists, archaeologists, genealogists, and we pieced this story together. That distillery where Nearest Green was, was distillery number seven. He's the only known master distillery, distiller for distillery number seven. Wow. And it sat on those grounds. And when Jack became old enough, he was out there selling that booze. Nearest would make it. He was, he cornered the, he cornered the soldier's market, the military market. Yeah. You had the, 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 the soldiers that were fighting nearby, the Confederate soldiers. And Jack, because he was so small, 
the there was a shoot to kill order for any person who tried to sell alcohol to the soldiers. But it was during the winter months. Yes. It's freezing. They wanted alcohol. Mm -hmm. But alcohol isn't great for shooting. <laughs> yeah. For be, you yeah. know, being on the battlefield. You don't necessarily want not, your people drinking not encouraged. alcohol, yeah, yeah. right? And so there was a there was a shoot to kill order. Well, Jack had this thought was who's going to kill a kid? He wasn't tech. I mean, at that point he was 15, but who's going to shoot this little kid? So he grabs his cousin Button Wagner, and they literally go and they pack a bunch of, of liquor underneath meat and deliver it and deliver it to the soldiers. So he cornered that market very early on, and they really, loved him. and loved him. Yes, loved him. And if I mean to this day. When you look at the military, they have remained so loyal to Jack Daniel, the brand, and I love it. And most of them have no idea of the history of it and how it even passed to them and why their dad drank Jack Daniels and why their grandfather drank, drank and great grandfather have no idea. It's because literally Jack cornered that market That's during amazing. the Civil War. It's amazing. And, and so you have him as a salesperson making money and when he made enough money to be able to buy the distillery from Dan Call, mm. that distillery, distillery number seven, was renamed Jack Daniel Distillery on the property that we owned. And between the time it began in 1884, when he moved to the new location and near Green retired, mm -hmm. Jack Daniel Distillery always operated on our property. That's some, Tell me something, mm -hmm. I just, just, I just wanna know. Yeah. You're a very sharp, I think, brilliant woman. Thank you. How does a, a little girl grow up to evolve into you? How did you do this? You know, it's funny. I left home when I was 15 years old, very, mm. very early on. And, and actually, because we're in the Bay, you have a Covenant House here. Yes. I spent my 18th birthday in Covenant House. Okay. And I know I have, Covenant House well. I, I, the Covenant House in Hollywood. Yes. is where I was, and I have such an a, affinity for what they did. But I left home early because I think there are certain children, I, now that I've done personality tests and all that, okay. I know that for a, for a girl, uh, my personality test is less than 0.08% of the world or something like nope. that. So very small okay. number of my particular personality type. Well, it's really hard to raise a child who is a leader almost mm -hmm. from birth mm -hmm. and doesn't understand why you have the right to tell her what to do what just to because do. you've been here longer. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't... It doesn't yeah. look cute. Yeah. And it came to a head when I was 15 and they, they gave, my parents gave me an ultimatum to just like fall in line or ship out and I was like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be ship shipping out. out. Yeah. And, but I think how that child became who I am is I never had anyone to mold me in a way that wasn't me. Hmm. Most people go through their life trying to get back to who they really were intended to be. Between that age of four and seven, when we're both most moldable, yeah. is the time where people are telling us, sit down, be quiet, fall in line, like that becomes the molding. And so then people spend their whole life trying to break free of that. Yes. I never allowed the molding. And God bless my parents. <laughs> I just uh, appreciate you, but that's... I never yeah. allowed the molding. And so I, I tell people, Fawn Weaver is literally a fully realized seven-year-old. That person Th that's who I was Fawn. always meant to be is exactly who I am. And it, I never struggled with who I am and, 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 and this power that comes from me when I walk into any boardroom, I don't care what the makeup mm -hmm. of that boardroom is, mm -hmm. I sit down like not only do I belong there, but y'all are all in huge, bit, like it, it is, it's your honor to also be there, right? Yeah, right. I walk in with that, and, but I, I didn't have to build up to that. It this was just there. It was always just there. And, and so I think because there was no one to take that power away from me as a young child, I haven't had to spend years like a lot of people do hmm. trying to peel back what's my purpose, what's my, my purpose is to do whatever's in front of me with excellence until hmm. the next thing is revealed, then I do that with excellence. And then the next thing, I do that with excellence. And I, I think that a lot of people are always seeking, yeah. they're always looking, looking for something greater, bigger, and I have always thought what's right in front of me, if I do it with yes. excellence, that is the greater, that is the bigger. 
until the next thing comes. It's amazing. Which leads me to what you want to do with the historically black colleges yeah. now and helping students yeah. around the country. Yeah. And my company, I have quite a few HBCU alumni, I have quite a few Divine Nine, which are the black fraternities yeah. and sororities that began in the HBCUs. And w one of the things that, that African Americans as, and black people as, as a whole seem to be really concerned about last year was when Deion Sanders made the decision to mm -hmm. go to Colorado. Yeah. That, that spotlight that was on him, that came with him to the HBCUs, that it was going to go away. It's a little bit like Martin Luther King. When he showed up, yeah. he didn't show up by himself just with his boys. He showed up with cameras. So that's why they would say, oh, here comes that, that, that guy and he's bringing the circus in town. Yeah. Because yeah. he always showed up with cameras. So the world was able to see what was happening to African Americans when Martin Luther King Jr. was alive because he always showed up with cameras. Well, Martin Luther King, he got his degree from Morehouse, right? Yes. An historically black yes. college and university. Yes. And I have Morehouse men in my company. And so when I'm looking at this and listening to all the conversations people were having, I think conversations are, are good. I think complaining is nonsense. It doesn't help anything. Okay. Most people just talk on social media, but they actually don't do anything about it. They just like hearing their voice or maybe seeing their voice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, but for me, I'm such an action-oriented person. And so I'm looking at this and going, okay, Dion is leaving. They're not wrong. The cameras are going to go where Dion yes. is, which means that the cameras are not going to be on HBCUs. But I have so many cameras on me because I've built the first and only successful uh, spirit brand that was uh, built by a, uh, a an African-American, by a black woman. It's the only bourbon, and, and bourbon, that is that is our largest spirit in terms of volume, in terms yes. of sales in America. It's America's spirit, if you will. And I'm the first one to build that wasn't a white male. It's in amazing. Our, in our country's history. So I have <laughs> so many eyeballs on me. When we crossed the 100 million mark, we became the most successful black-owned distillery in the world. And so... How about 100 million million in sales in sales it took us five it took us uh, about five and a half years to get there but we will do another hundred million this year alone so it took five years five and a half years to get to the first hundred we'll hit 200 in our six and a half years and Bravo. and so thank you but as we're as we're building this out then there's so many eyeballs on me yes. and my company because people are going how did they do that? This wasn't supposed to work. It's not. It's never yeah. worked before. How did it work? And so because I have so many CEOs, so many heads of sales and marketing and things looking at me, I said, okay, well, let's do this. How about I shift the spotlight to HBCUs? And mm -hmm. while they're watching me, they're going to be looking at this. A lot of people want companies to be altruistic. It's never going to happen. They're capitalists. Yes. That is the nature of who they are. Yeah. So you have to show them how to actually make capital in order for them to move. And mm. Uncle Nearest has become the proof of concept. When I came into the industry, I literally, my first speaking engagement in the industry was to a, a thousand white men, not hyperbole. That was the room. Really? The only women that were there were the two that were planning it and the two I brought with me. Every, it was a, a sea of white men. I just did a, a speaking engagement recently in, in our industry and it was everybody. In that short period of time between Uncle Nearest becoming successful became the proof of concept. So when I came in, there were no women leading any of the spirit conglomerates. There's essentially six spirit conglomerates. Mm. Now, at 2023, three of the six are run by women. Wow. The industry has changed so much because we were the proof of concept. All of a sudden, wait a minute, black people know what they're doing in spirits, women know what they're doing in spirits, they're able to build on a shoestring budget, mm -hmm. they're able to pivot very quickly during COVID, we pivoted so much faster than the big guys. And so they've been watching this and I said, okay, so watch this. Our, our number one selling cocktail across the country is the old fashioned. And so we're going to do an HBCU old fashioned cocktail challenge, HBCU challenge. And so every cocktail that's being made, I had one at the one hotel earlier yes. last night, 
every single one, we donate a dollar to the top 58 HBCUs in this country. And, and so I'm looking at other companies and saying, okay, now you do it. You do it. Yeah. So this is, this is not meant to be the end all be all. We'll do this every year. And this year it's a million. Next year it'll be two. The year after that it'll be four, then eight. And we'll just keep going. But m my hope is that Uncle Nearest will not be the only one. Yes. But all of these companies will begin looking at what we're doing and say, hey, you know, we can we can sell more old fashions too if we partner with HBCUs because they have to see it in a capitalistic manner yes. in order to do it, right? Yeah. And which is fine. That's how that's what they need in order to move. For us, we're in the legacy cementing business. So we don't need to see the dollars to move. We need to see that it's going to help further cement the legacy of nearest green. Well, for us, what we're doing is cementing his legacy within the HBCUs and within the Divine Nines. And so our reasoning for doing it is different, but they'll be able to see that all of this buzz is growing. We have restaurants all over this country where you know, you've know you got Asians and, and whites and Hispanics yeah. all wearing shirts that say, Uncle Nearest HBCU Challenge, right? Those companies can see that and say, yes. all right, there, there's something here we should also partner with the HBCUs, and, and that's my hope. You're a great lady. As we begin to wind down, and I know how busy you are, what do you see ahead? Now, I, I, I can imagine you're a planner, you're yeah. a, a person who makes things happen. Mm -hmm. What do you see in the next five years? I don't see the next five years. I see the next 200. That's how I look at it, and I've been working my way backwards since for a very long time to where I see it in 100 years, 200 yeah. years. The Mount Rushmore of whiskey has always been Johnny, Jim, and, 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 uh, and Jack. Yeah. Those three J's have always been, and we're carving nearest into the side of that mountain. And that's how we will leave this, this lifetime, is making sure we have carved him in it but it's not just carving and him just being memorialized there. We want people to continue to see and talk and hear about him every day. The reason why all of us, whether we drink or not, are so familiar with Jack Daniel is everywhere we go, there's the bottle, mm -hmm. there's the face, there's the old number seven. Everywhere we go, same thing with Johnny Walker. And I want people to be speaking of near screen and what he contributed 100 and 200 years from now in the same manner. And so the work that we do this year, next year, the next 25 years is really to build this company so large that the next generation can't screw it up. That's, that's literally what yes. we are all doing. Every one of my leaders, we say that on a very regular basis. We are building this so large that the next generation can't screw it up. That you can't add anything to that. And I, I still believe the name Fawn Weaver should be on that mountain. Oh, Rushmore no, too. I don't care about Along it. Along with Uncle Neil, no, I, I really do. I don't care. It, because it's, you made it happen. I am so grateful that I was chosen to do this. Hmm. And I think a part of why I was chosen is because I don't care to be on that mountaintop. Interesting. I am very clear that if my name is not remembered, but Nearest Greens is, I have done my part. And I'm very proud of that. I get that. Fawn Weaver, thank you. Thank you. Man. You are an inspiration for men, women, children, corporations, a lot of people. And it's a pleasure to meet you. And it's a pleasure to learn about Uncle Nearest and the great things still to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fawn. I appreciate you, Dave. And thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Talk of the Town.